Welcome to the Media CFO Podcast, the show where we talk to people on the front lines of finance, business affairs, legal and strategy in the media and entertainment industry. I'm your host, Tobias Jaeger, and when I'm not hosting this podcast, I'm the CFO of television and content studio Colibri Studios in London. This episode is part two of a special double episode with Roland Weishofer, former chief financial officer of Bloomhouse Productions. Roland started his career more than 30 years ago as a supervising accountant at Coopers and Libran, which is part of PwC today. He spent the next decade in various accounting and financial management positions in the construction, automotive and manufacturing industry. When relocating to Los Angeles, he started a deep dive into the entertainment industry, where he held positions such as VP Finance, Chief Accounting Officer and Chief Financial Officer at companies like Cinema Now, Exclusive Media, Media Rights Capital and until recently, Bloomhouse Productions. You know, that and, um, and using um, just my track record, just trying to be a by-the-book accountant, by-the-book yeah. finance person, you know, someone that is not... Um, doesn't have the burden of all the industry experience that a lot of other people yeah. have potentially <laughs> and could have a fresh view and be, uh, um, you know, be the, be the same person in the room, hopefully. Yeah. Um, so what I, so what I did was I, I tried to get, uh, since full-time positions weren't available really, yeah. I tried to get consulting engagements. Yeah. Cause um, it was still in the aftermath of the financial crisis sure. and everyone was tightening you know, people, the belt. Right. People yeah. are still going to the movies. So there are obviously still companies out there that are yep. making movies um, and, and other companies that are seeing if they can get uh, a leg up, um, mm. as well as, um, you know, how the ones that w want to get in entertainment and think that, believe that the internet is the way to go versus traditional um, production distribution mm. methods. And so I ended up helping people with business plans. Um, the, har the hardest part, it wasn't hard to get consulting engagements the hardest mm. part was to get paid for consulting yeah. engagements because <laughs> you know, everybody promised you know anything but money for just, uh, just help us now and then yeah you know, and then when down this the road. is the new unicorn then you know yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, okay yeah. yeah so i mean there were there were some people that if, if i thought that they had a really interesting uh track record mm. and uh had a lot of experience within the industry and wanted to go out on their own and needed some help um then i was more willing to uh, to help them out. And, and even there was, you know, the one guy that I, uh, I became good friends with, um, went out on his own and, and it took him quite a while. And, and he and I were working in one office together and, you know, whenever he had a spare few dollars, he would say, here, let me cut you a check for what you've done sort of thing. That's nice. Um, so yeah, so I, I felt like at least they were, I wasn't being taken advantage of yeah. that This person was genuinely, you know, cutting a check out of their own bank account to try and move their business forward. Yeah. And because uh, I mean, in this situation, you're you're practically an investor in the company. You know? right. You're giving your time, and you, so in in that time of uncertainty, you also evaluate these things. Of course, like, well, is this where I would really put my my money? Mm -hmm. uh, so it's nice to see that someone acknowledges that because I think that doesn't happen a lot. That people understand that you know you are actually an investor. Mm -hmm. uh, in that business, no, and I, and I think I definitely saw myself that way. I, mm. I you know, I, I, I like the. I learned at that point in time already that I did really like the entrepreneurial thing, and mm. that I, um, I enjoy you know trying to help build the business. Um, and as, as as long as you know the environment is is right, and the the person you know, trying to build something is relatively sane and has an interesting <laughs> view on, uh, and I'll come back to that later, but um, has an interesting view on on their piece of the whole industry and how yep. they can take make money off of that and take advantage of that, then, uh, you know, then I'm all in yep. for, you know, obviously for whatever time it takes um, and when it still makes sense. And and by the way, this, this guy is, uh, is, is still a good friend and uh, long after I had to leave him for a real paying job. Yeah. <laughs> um, he actually grew that company into wow. a business and, and released some movies and, um, you know, did a lot of, has done a lot of stuff for streamers and, and various it's other uh, distribution. Yeah. So he's yeah. actually doing quite well now. Um, and you know, is, is still a great guy. So it's kind of fun yeah. for me anyway, I get to charge it. thinking back to when we we're, 
you know, sitting in borrowed offices and, yeah. and, and just working through models and, you know, trying to figure out, you know, pricing and whatever it is, you know, no. just all that crazy stuff. Um, but that actually worked out. So, so, I mean, that was fun. Um, I also helped um, a company called Open Road Films mm-hmm. um, only because I knew the guy who was going to be CEO. Uh, I was helping him with his business model um, because he was uh, backed by a private equity firm. Mm-hmm. And, you know, those guys are full of analysts that do yep. nothing but build Excel models. No. <laughs> um, but, you know, it, so uh, you got to keep them entertained. You got to keep them entertained. Literally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So under the garbage in, garbage out, you know, it's still, I need someone who knows something to look at it and uh, go, yeah, this looks right or no, this is not right. Uh, and so that's kind of what I, I did for him. And he had already, uh, before I approached him or, or he approached me, had already hired a CFO from a major studio. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, perfectly nice guy, smart guy, whatever. But, you know, if you're coming from a major studio and going into a startup yep. entertainment company, that's an entirely different world. So, yep. uh, different set of assumptions. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You don't have an entire infrastructure behind you. Yeah. Um, and so part of my job was to uh, teach him all the things that he should be thinking about mm-hmm. as now a small company CFO, oh. which oh. is far more broad-based uh, yeah. set of responsibilities than uh, than a, a CFO at a major studio. So anyway, that was that was kind of fun. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I didn't take any, um, it didn't bother me that he had hired someone else as a CFO. I mean, it was, it kind of was what it was. I, yeah. wasn't, I wasn't 100% sure on the business model anyway. So yeah. um, it's, uh, it, it was pure distribution. Uh, but theatrical distribution and um, ended up being, you know, just as risky as, you know, the <laughs> internet distribution company I had in that it was just more money that was made oh. and lost oh. uh, in that, in that situation. So unfortunately they flamed out over time, but you know, they were, they were around for a while. So that was kind of fun. And then I, and then I did a, a temporary thing at uh, media rights capital, which mm-hmm. was sort of growing at the time and had uh, just done, I think they had just negotiated the deal with Netflix on House of Cards. Wow, uh, yeah. So that was a bit of a trailblazing moment for them. And uh, their VP finance had left. And so I came in and, and, and um, you know, installed a new accounting software system and helped them try to find a replacement uh, yep. of VP finance, um, that sort of stuff. But, all you know, all those experiences gave me a bit more... Uh, not to overuse the word experience again in, in the industry, but yep. now I'm, I'm crawling toward traditional content creation yep. as opposed to all these ancillary uh, yep. businesses. And you get so much context out of this as well, you know, which mm-hmm. obviously is super helpful when, you know, you've seen uh, an industry or, or something from so many different angles, you know, slightly different. Mm-hmm. Um, you obviously, you know, whatever you do after that, you have so much context that you can, you know, um, you know, just not just the experience, but also saying like, oh, okay, this, like, I know if someone says, here is this and mm-hmm. it's five, then obviously you can, oh, that's very low or that's very high. Right. And, and I think that's a lot of the times, especially now when the rules seem to be changing a little bit as well, again, that, uh, and, and, uh, you know, some new normal mm-hmm. is going to come up, um, that that is incredibly valuable to have. Yeah, no, I, I absolutely right. I mean, that's that's the benefit of experience is that, you know, especially as you progress in your career or even achieve whatever highest position you're going to achieve. And, you know, if CFO is it, that that's fine. Uh, but, you know, you're moving at such a fast speed and, mm. and there's just so much going on all the time that you, you have to draw on that experience to you know, as I'd say, give something the smell test. I mean, does this yeah. actually smell right or does it not <laughs> no, smell right? Yeah. I mean, it just, you can look at something quickly and go, mm, I don't think that's quite right. Yeah. I think we want more want to look into this. No. Um, and that's super valuable. And it's, and it's hard to, you can't start your career doing that because yeah. then you'd be some sort of savant or whatever. And that, you know, doesn't happen very often. Um, but you're absolutely right. That, that um, you know, started to get me more ingrained in the dirty details mm. of the business um, <laughs> so that I could have that perspective yep. and uh, and start to make recommendations on how to maybe change things or make them better or whatever yep. it is. Um, so anyway, so that, yeah, so I totally agreed. And I'm sure that that got me 
finally my next full time job. Yeah. Uh, you know, I waited until 2011 for that to happen. But um, at a uh, at the time very traditional independent film company. Yeah. Um, you know, back then there wasn't. Um, you were either in TV or you were in film. You were yep. never in both. Yeah, there, there was <laughs> a very different world. There was no both. <laughs> no, there was no there was no both at all. Um, and there was film up here and TV down here. Right. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, because TV at the time <laughs> demanded an awful lot of money to try and make yep. it work. No. Yep. Which is why most of television was created through studios, yep. like major studios back then, because of the investment involved. And that's obviously changed a lot today. But. Um, but that would, but the, that experience as exclusive media was uh, was great. I mean, it was uh, it, to me in, in my career and my uh, sort of improving my knowledge in the film space was like boot camp. Yeah, there was a lot going on. It was all very risky. We were private yeah. equity backed. It was uh, you know we had companies in the UK, in the US. You know, we were buying libraries. But we had the the overlord private equity was in <laughs> Amsterdam. Um, so as the chief accounting officer, as opposed yeah. to the CFO, I, it was, there was a whole bunch of stuff to deal with just in getting yeah. audited financial statements it's translating together. Translating it, uh, yeah. I mean, you're not just language, but numbers as right. well and systems. Well, and all the boring oh. uh, accounting concepts that are oh. different. Every country has their own interpretation of it. Oh. <laughs> um, but 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 you know, at that time, and that was the model at the time was that films were financed and greenlit by a combination of foreign pre-sales mm -hmm. and uh and production loans yep. and a and obviously you know a distribution strategy in the u.s yep. um, and so that seemed very cookie cutter of course you were still beholden to the um the success or failure at the box office yeah but at the end of the day you could mitigate a lot of the risk of doing a 20 30 40 million dollar production by having foreign presales mm. um, that covered the bulk of your of your budget, um, and that model worked well enough, um, and a lot of people uh, made a lot of money at the time doing that. Uh, it uh, a lot of foreign sales companies started up uh, at that time yeah. as well because that model worked so well, and. All we've seen since then is that model has gone away. Mm. I mean, foreign pre-sales still exist, but they're a shadow of their former selves. Yep. So you, that's why you really don't see a lot of independent 20, 30, 40 million dollar movies being made. Yep. Um, you know, unless you're Megan Ellison, I guess, or you have some, <laughs> some deep pockets somewhere of your <laughs> I was own. About to say, <laughs> unless you have some deep pockets. Yeah. <laughs> Usually short fingers, but deep pockets. Yeah, uh. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, but you know, and, and I'm sure the industry will find another financial model that'll work down the road that'll resurrect yep. that. Yep. Um, but anyway, it was you know for me it was it was fascinating to finally be on the inside of content creation and all that goes on and all that's required and you know really the tremendous risk that's involved and that every film is a new business. Yep. Um, when you think about the millions of dollars that go into making one particular movie, yep. every movie is a startup. Yep, exactly. Yeah. Um and uh it's it's uh it's very it's a very risky business. Yeah. Um yeah, I mean that's essentially I think like a bigger production house like that it's almost like a company incubator mm -hmm. uh, or accelerator um where you're just trying to, you know, validate the project and you know give it as much uh you know <laughs> as many references why this is a great idea but right. like the tech startup uh, as you mentioned mm -hmm. you know um uh, and and then hope that you know that works out and i think something like the the foreign sales um i mean the the line of visibility of those things seems to have just shifted in a sense that an organization like netflix they must know or they must be able to anticipate somehow how different markets react to projects that they do and, and, mm -hmm. and make decisions based on that. Um, but obviously, if you're a production house, you you don't really have access to the data or, the, you know, that kind of uh, insight. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I think... The, the, no, the, that's a great point, actually. Yeah. I hadn't, uh, hadn't actually thought of it that way, but, I mean, it is... You're right. If we fast forward to today, you know, yeah. Netflix is a end-to-end... Um, kind yep. of like a major studio would yep. be. Um, 
with the secret sauce being that they don't tell anybody anything. No, no. So nobody actually knows how well or poorly anything <laughs> yeah, exactly. does. You can only judge that the, yeah. judge it or guess based on what goes up and what comes down yeah. off their, their site. But not even in the financials. I mean, if you dive into their financials, all you see is whether more people signed up or not. Right. Uh, but you don't know how, how many hours they, or minutes or seconds mm -hmm. <laughs> they watched of anything. Um, for me, it always um, seems a bit like the 1930s, 1940s US <laughs> studio model. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, where they try to own the whole value chain, including the stars and everything. Right. Uh, but it's just today, you know, and <laughs> mm -hmm. technology allows that yeah, today. It just exactly. makes it different. And, and um, so I, I always think it's funny how history repeats mm -hmm. you know slightly you know with a different flavor uh, yeah but um yeah so from there you went and then um you're like okay this is content production now a production right. house um you know we made some uh investments on the side yeah and you know within four or five years uh like most independents like i said earlier it started to fail yeah and the the big problem with this one was, you know, you had a willing investor that put over a hundred million dollars into the company, wow. mm -hmm. but um, like any private equity firm, VC, whatever you want to call it, any yeah. investor really, um, you want to you don't just want your money back, you want to return on your money, yep, yep. Um, and you understand the risk involved, yep. so you want an even higher return. Yep. Um, and, and the 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 thing that sunk the company, interestingly, in, in retrospect, was the fact that. The first three films that were released um, all failed mm. uh, to various degrees. And so after one and a half years, you're now in the hole, call it $20 million, something like that. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, if you're the CEO, now you're like, okay, now, now I've <laughs> got to make that 20 back. And then some, and invest in the new project, and invest yeah. in a new project, and that yeah. has to return even more yeah. to make up for that. So that the overall yeah. looks like yeah. a win. And by the way, I'm also burning overhead yeah. every day that we're here <laughs> as well, losing that money. Um, so what naturally happens then is exactly what you'd expect, which is the only way you get an outsized return is to take on greater risk. Yeah. And so subsequent projects then started taking on greater risk. Mm -hmm. um, the the other problem that arises uh, that I found interesting is that you know every every the lifeblood besides money of an entertainment company is being able to source great material mm -hmm. yep. uh, to produce. And whereas at the beginning, I wouldn't call it great content, but at mm -hmm. least there was flow of content mm -hmm. um, of material coming to into the company. But once you have a few failures. Mm you get less and less of that obviously because talent doesn't want to be attached to yep. a bad track record. You know, yep. they have enough problems of their own. So um, starting, you know, continuing to try and source content that would make up for the past failures and generate a return became even more difficult. Yep. And so we started doing crazy things like investing in other companies and whatever and or taking a, a project that actually had fantastic potential internationally mm. and uh, and taking all the risk in yeah. the US only where yeah. it w which was the one territory where nobody cared about that piece yeah. of content you know taking big bets like that yeah. uh, ended up sinking the company because yeah. you can have big rewards but you also have big failures yeah. of risk so that was that was a lesson in what how to manage ri or not manage risk in the yeah. entertainment business yeah. um, so that that's what i found interesting and learned a lot about in that you know besides the 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 bones of of, a, of an entertainment company <laughs> but i feel also i feel like um the situation you described obviously you know you have a huge investor uh you know private equity money means you know you're usually talking about three three digit million mm -hmm. dollar amounts um but i feel like the exact same dynamics and mechanics can also uh be applied to smaller companies because um, I feel like, you know, especially um, when I was doing investment banking, I would speak to, you know, smaller production companies or IP owners, they wanted to raise money. I think one component that they like to overlook was that the investor they were talking to or they wanted to attract, usually someone had invested in that investor as well. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, private equity 
uh, funds they they source their capital as well from other like pension funds or you, you know yeah. you name it. Um, so they they often seem to not anticipate what kind of the needs, if you will, are mm-hmm. from from that investor, uh, and that's where you know kind of it, it starts to go wrong <laughs> before it even started. Yeah. It's like well you know there's you know you can tell a great story, uh, but as you said, then if you know the first one doesn't work out, then oopsie daisy. You know mm-hmm. you have to you know the second one has to be three times as great as <laughs> as the model says because it needs to make up for the first one and the right. the, the other one um <laughs> well i think so, i think i had mentioned this to someone else that um you know the the film business is y- you have to take a portfolio approach yeah um just like the the vcs and the private yep. equity firms they yep. know they're going to have winners and losers they just yep. hope that the winners make up more than the losers exactly. lose um but in, in, in the film industry it's the same thing yep. and every business plan that you read will acknowledge that yep. and and <laughs> show you that in, page. <laughs> yeah, yeah and show and shows you that in aggregate oh. you know you will it will make money it will be yep. successful this model yep. will work and what that exclusive media experience taught me is that the order of the successes and failures matters more than yeah. whether you think overall 10 films that's are going to make you money. True. Yeah. Yeah. Because if you're behind the eight ball and then you could burn through all yeah. your cash in three movies and then have none to yeah. left to make seven more. Yeah. It reminds me of a, a, a story I heard about a startup uh, here in, in Europe. Uh, don't want to use their name. Right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, and so they had received uh, um, a substantial investment, a couple hundred thousand from some angels. Um, for something that they had promised that they would do, mm-hmm. um, which they didn't have, um, you know, they they kind of had an idea of how they would get there, um, and instead of you know, kind of saying, okay, we'll try to build this, uh, they actually took this money and invested it in Google stock, um, <laughs> and then eight months later, that had exploded, mm-hmm. um, and so they were delivering an enormous return, right, uh, and. Um, and then basically use that money that they had, I think, um, close to doubled yeah. uh, in that time. Uh, they used that to build the technology and then they ended up um, you know, delivering on what oh they had my promised. <laughs> but, Jeez, <laughs> that's lucky. <laughs> and exactly, when I heard that, I was like, oh my God, this is like, it could have gone the other way as oh, well. And, so quickly. Uh, and um, what's so like, kudos. You know, to the to the chutzpah you need to do that. No kidding. Uh, but um, buy lottery tickets. <laughs> uh, exactly. Um, so from there, you decided, okay, this is still you know I like content creation, and you joined uh, Bloomhouse from there. Even pretty much. I mean, the the what the way things went down at Exclusive was that um, I will call it unceremoniously. Right after, at least they let us have Christmas, and then in January uh, wow. fourth, they showed up on mass from Amsterdam, and um, and and had hired uh, an HR consultant yeah. to decide who's going to go and who's going to stay. Yeah. So basically, seventy five percent of the staff had wow. to go, and twenty five percent got to stay. And of course, senior management yeah. had to go because they were to blame for everything. Of course, um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, that's. <laughs> but um, at the time, the um, the people from the private equity firm uh, pulled me aside as well as the head of business legal affairs and said, we want you two to run the company. Mm-hmm. And uh, so naturally we were flattered no. and, uh, and and started thinking about what we, what we could do. This is like no. our company to run no. now. Now we, now we get to be the guy in the corner office and no. it'll be so much fun <laughs> and we'll go to every festival and fly around the world. It'll be great. Um and then uh, get a branded corporate jet. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so once, once you know, all those dreams sort of flew through our head, and we started talking about it, it came to realize that, well, hang on a second, what is it we're managing? Oh. We just there's just a library of titles now. There's no <laughs> no more making movies. There's no more selling movies. Oh. There's no more nothing. Oh. It's just you know, cashing checks and opening the mail, oh. um, which doesn't do much for one's career. Oh. Uh, so. So I decided that, well, I guess I guess have to look for the next opportunity. No. And uh, so luckily this time, I didn't have to be out of a job to find another job. So I had heard about a uh, uh, an opportunity at Blumhouse where um, Jason Blum, the uh, owner and founder, had decided that instead of 
uh, continuing to be a producer for hire, which is basically just somebody that makes movies but doesn't invest their own money in yeah. it and takes fees, um, he wanted to expand into, call it a mini studio. Mm -hmm. And you know he had had built up a good track record of delivering films that perform well uh, at the box office at a low cost that, um, that, he, that he felt it would be um, possible to build that. I wouldn't say probable, but no. possible. And so, so therefore, I mean, he had never had any other senior executives in his company before. Mm. The highest ranking person beside him was uh, head of physical production. Yeah. Um, and I think, and I think he, he had a, a head of business legal affairs as well, but that was about it. So he had hired me as the chief financial officer and uh, another gentleman as the president who was, you know, 30, 35 years deep in uh, experience in the entertainment industry and was quite well known and, yeah. and everything and, uh, and a really smart guy. And so I saw this as, uh, as a great opportunity yeah. both to, again, build a company, which is kind of what I like to do. Um, you know, in this instance, the company had built itself to a certain point and then wanted to go beyond that. Yeah. So it was perfect to go in there at that point in time, uh, given that we were looking at closing some equity money uh, mm -hmm. for the business and there was no debt on the books. There was cash in the bank. It was highly unusual for an yeah. independent entertainment like, company. How did that happen? Yeah, it just doesn't <laughs> usually happen in that. Num so. Number one, that someone says, instead of saying, uh, oh, I can do this like by myself mm -hmm. and I'll be the best at it, he actually goes out and you know finds two very senior people to join the team yeah. and say like, no, no, obviously, you know, like I'm good at this, you know, mm -hmm. you seem to be good at that, you do that. Yep. Uh, and then you, you <laughs> open the books and you're like, wow, what's what's going on? <laughs> yeah. How did he get this far without getting himself into trouble? Yeah. Yeah. No. So it was it was it was a great uh, a great situation. The you know the the foundation of everything was in in my mind very good. Yeah. Uh, you know because again you don't want to walk in and say you know we're behind the eight ball by tens of millions of dollars yep. and but we think that this will turn it around. Yep. Because then you're just under stress from day one. And the industry is stressful enough as it is uh, when you're when you're in it. So so here we had a uh, a blank sheet uh, upon which to build a business around the core, which was low budget horror films that yep. you know make uh, a decent amount of money. And if you go back to sort of the portfolio approach of making films, you know this model works really well because when you lose, you don't lose a lot of money. Mm -hmm. It's only a few million dollars to yep. make those films. But if you make, if you win, yep. usually you make an outsized return. Yep. So you can have a few losers and then a bunch of winners and the order matters less than when you're making bigger budgeted pictures. And, um, and, and if you take that as a, you know, consider that lower risk proposition for the business in general, and then you can build around it yep. um, much more easily and also convince banks and whomever else yep. to invest a bit of money with you to help get there faster so which also seems like a, a pretty smart vc approach you know even if you mm -hmm. let's say have only 20 million dollars at your disposal mm -hmm. instead of saying like, okay we're gonna make one extremely big nice i mean 20 million dollar for an indie film is, is uh, i guess you nowadays <laughs> again yeah i mean now it's uh, a big big budget again mm -hmm. um but i think like five ten years ago and there was like a small film right um and and so instead of saying okay we'll do one you know for 20 or two for 10 saying like oh no how can we do 20 films with that yeah you know? exactly <laughs> it is, one of them is bound to you know produce something yeah um just like vc you know fund will not invest 20 million or maybe they will Uh, at some later, you know, stage in the company's life cycle, mm -hmm. uh, but you know, betting one million dollars on 20 companies uh, seems seems like a logical yeah. thing to do. But in film, I guess not everyone was thinking of that. No, uh, exactly. And I mean, to 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 that analogy, you know, Universal Studios is really the VC, if you will, or private yeah. equity for for Blumhouse in that. Um, you know, Jason had delivered a series of successful pictures to them already. Yeah. And 
where they had financed the production. Yep. Um, and so they were very eager to sign mm. a longer term uh, first look deal yep. uh, with the company to be able to, because they knew that internally in a major studio, you're not gonna make uh, the $5 million film that Blumhouse was making would cost them 10 or 15. Yep. Um, and so it's, it's uh, sometimes it's smarter to outsource versus have stuff yep. in house. So whatever, <laughs> whatever participations we were able to get on success yeah. still paled in comparison to how much it would have cost them internally to make it. Mm. And so it was a, a deal that worked for both really well. And it really, uh, you know, funded the growth of the business because it was throwing off cash. Yeah. Um, and so, so with that, we were able to launch a, uh, a distribution arm mm -hmm. and try self distribution on our own for, you know, again, in, 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 in the same sort of vein of low budget, it was kind of low budget P&A, uh, get some screens, work together with Universal, yep. um, and see if we can't turn something that w is not worthy of a major uh, or a wide release, but maybe make some money off of that anyway. You know, and go to the banks and raise the money so you can borrow the P&A dollars that you need. And uh, I mean, that was probably the one thing that, Kind of worked for a bit, but mm -hmm. we quickly realized that y you don't you don't win necessarily. It's actually more difficult than you think to make back yeah. P and A spend, and <laughs> and so it just yeah it was it was we pulled back from that uh, very quickly because it just didn't work. Again, it's one of those where the first couple don't work, yeah. then all of a sudden the money you borrowed, okay, well we don't have much left, so now yeah. what are we going to do? Yeah. Um, you can't turn those bad movies into good ones further down the road, <laughs> so they're not going to throw more money off. Um, you know, but we we did run some more uh, Facebook ads. Yeah, you know, people will go watch it. <laughs> I know. Well, you know, and along those lines, we actually uh, partnered up with some tech guys to launch an ad tech company in in with the express purpose of getting them to use their proprietary technology yeah. in advertising films. Yeah. Um, you know, every studio was putting more money to digital versus traditional media spend, and uh, but the money was going to major ad companies mm -hmm. that would basically, you know, back their truck up to Facebook with a bunch of money and say here, you know, <laughs> Do something just, amazing. just send the trailer around <laughs> to everybody um, with, without being able to track or understand how people engaged yep. with the, with it at all. So it was a black hole that it was going into. Wow. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, the short story is with this, with this uh, tech company is ad tech company is that, they their technology allowed them to track behavior very granularly, mm -hmm. and so they could uh, they could segment the addressable audience into very tiny segments and direct and redirect the spend to wherever whatever quadrant was engaging yep. more or less with the content. So and it where it worked and it and it worked yeah yep. it worked really well and you were able to report back and say you know here was the engagement uh, yep. levels of the spend. Whereas the bigger, older advertising companies were like, I don't know, <laughs> you know. So, uh, but we'll probably need more money. <laughs> yeah, but we'll probably exactly we'll need more money. So it, it was a way to, and 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 you know, I'm sure it's not perfect yet. Every technology is a perpetual beta, but um, at least it started pulling people toward some metrics that are mm. measurable in the advertising online advertising space. Uh, in the absence of Nielsen ratings or whatever you know there is on traditional media, um, so that that was uh, you know going back to my internet days of yeah. tech startup, uh, a bunch <laughs> of guys in their late twenties and early thirties that knew a lot about tech, knew nothing about movies, um, and knew nothing about really nothing about building a company, yeah. you know the infrastructure and everything that you need. So the president and I got to play the adults in the room as they were building the company yep. and helping them with all of the sort of block and tackle stuff that, uh, that you need to worry about. And, and they started staffing up people and you know, we got them more gigs because we knew the studios and they didn't and, uh, and helping them with pricing and fundraising yep. and all that. It was, it was, uh, I mean, they, they, they're now at, I think they're at a hundred plus employees and a hundred million wow. plus in revenue or yeah. whatever. I mean, they're doing really, really well. And it's, uh, it's fun to think back, um, you know, to being at the ground level of, of that and, yeah. and being in the room and we say, Hey, we should do this together sort of thing. So even within the company, that wasn't even the objective of me being hired into that company to be able to, you know, 
to overuse the term incubate, you know, another <laughs> another venture that well, I'm sure will be quite valuable to yeah. the company overall. Um, but, and, and also, you know, it, it helps not only in just being an investment, but it helps in learning that part of the business that is growing and changing yeah. drastically. Um, and how a traditional film company slash TV company can utilize that technology for their own benefit uh, as well. So, you know, it was very synergistic and, and, and all that sort of fun stuff. Uh, you know, just like, <clears throat> you know, we made an investment in an online original uh, content creation company mm -hmm. that uh, you know, was started by this super young guy who is really smart and a real go-getter. And uh, I mean, he's built that thing up already as well you know, quite a bit, but it, 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 but it, since he was focused on horror and the horror audience, it fit perfectly with, with what we were doing and was another avenue that we wanted to go into, but yep. you know, some, it's another one of those better to outsource that <laughs> ability than try and build it in house, no, no. you know, because us old guys are supposed to help you build the business. We're not creative enough to know what, <laughs> you know, what the, what the content should be. But anyway, um, so that, and then of course, uh, getting an investment to explode the uh, TV side of the business yeah. and, and move that brand and leverage that brand in the TV side, which, um, you know, with, with making some of the right hires in the executive side of that business has really exploded the, um, the television side where it's already bigger than the film side. Um, you know, and that really takes us to today, which is why is that? Because all the money's going to TV now, <laughs> yeah. uh, as opposed to film. So uh, th there's this, uh, companies are starting for content on that side. And it's mostly tech companies that think mm -hmm. they have to have content to uh, remain relevant and grow their brand and retain users and all that sort of stuff. I yeah. mean, we just read the other day that Snap uh, had a better quarter, really because original content allowed them to keep their audience engaged and yeah. not lose as many people and maybe even get one or two more, yeah, not a lot, yeah. but uh, it certainly it didn't help their bottom line as much, but their top line, you know, mm. went up. And so now they're going to go, well, that's working. So let's throw let's more at more it. So, that, yeah. 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 And, and the interesting, and then of course with the, you know, wallet size, they, you know, the tech yeah. companies have, the, you're again talking like, oh, let's put 150 mil in, Content. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, well, okay. Yeah, I mean that's that's why it's a it's a it's a uh, an arms race that's never been seen before in the industry. I don't with you no. know, with this level of money because once you introduce Apple, Facebook, Google with YouTube and all that no. into the space, I mean these are companies with, I mean Apple sitting on almost three hundred billion in cash. So no. I mean nobody's put that kind of money in the film industry, no. entertainment industry before. So now no. that if they determine that they need content to remain relevant. No they're going to throw all kinds of money at it. Yep. So that's why now that you've expanded the universe of channels, yep. you've got to fill those channels with content. Yep. And we started this arms race with only a finite amount of people that can create the content. Yep. So <laughs> it's really difficult. Uh, <laughs> and that's why you're seeing so many more coming into the space now, yeah. because you got to take the money when it's available. That's true. So you just mentioned all the like different stages and activities that you went through uh, there. And I was wondering, like, as there's so much happening um, and different things that, you know, kind of demand your focus, mm -hmm. how, like, how did the day in the life of the CFO look like? Um, and how did you <laughs> prioritize the activities right. out, um, on, on what you're going to do? Yeah, I mean, I think that... Um you know, when you tell the story very quickly, it makes it sound like everything's happening all at once, which it, it never is. You sort of, you're doing one thing and then the yeah. other than the other for the most part. Um, but of course, when you're, when you're growing a business, you know, the first part of the day is usually dedicated to dealing with what is actually going on in the business yeah. on a day-to-day -day, uh, level, which, you know, we could say is just the film side of it. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and then, um, you know, and then you would switch to, okay, where are we with, the television investment yep. or the model or whatever it is, or, you know, what are we doing with, you know, we've got a board meeting coming up on the TV side or, yep. or whatever it is. Um, I mean, it, it, it's always, it's always one of those things where whatever you intend to do at the beginning of the day never gets done because <laughs> whatever is happening is, uh, has to be attended to immediately. Because yeah, I, I think that's something that's 
like anyone who's running a company, whether it's like a, a one man band or there's a thousand people, mm -hmm. you always have the challenge of how do you make sure that you're not just running around to, you know, put out fires, mm -hmm. uh, but actually manage to carve out some time, you know, to, you know, as you said, to focus on the big building blocks, the important things. Yeah. Um, how, so how did you do that for yourself in, well, I mean, you're, I've had to build a team mm. because the the only way I can free up the time to work on these special projects or uh, work on, on expanding the business in a different direction or whatever is to make sure that that day-to-day -day stuff that I was doing in the first half of the day that I have staff that, um, that can take care of most of that for me. So they're really just um, looking at things that absolutely need to be looked at um, for a short period of time. Yeah, and uh, you know, having meetings as much as everybody hates to have meetings, but you have those meetings to, <laughs> you know, catch Death up by and, meeting. Yeah, yeah, so that they can ask me questions, I can ask them questions, yeah. and then we can have a game plan going forward, whether it's for the day, the week, the month, or whatever. Um, but I mean, of course, that introduces its own issues with yeah. do you have the right people and and all that sort of fun stuff, and that's sort of what you have to manage through. Uh, in order to, in order to free yourself up to do the stuff that um, is important to growing the business at a higher level and yeah. not doing it at midnight sort of thing yeah um, yeah so that's 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 really what it was and then understanding okay what type of person do I need to help me out here at this point mm. in time so they don't have to so I can sleep at night yeah and not get in trouble <laughs> as well yeah. uh, one thing obviously you've been in this industry for for a long time but I'm wondering, if you could go back in time and meet your like 20 year old self, what recommendation would you have? <laughs> yeah. I mean, every, probably everybody wishes they could have that ability. <laughs> um, I, I, I guess, I mean, one thing, one thing is a bit of patience mm. um, because obviously, you know, none of this stuff happens overnight and you only gain the experience by doing it. And by doing it, that means time. Yeah. Um, so you, you have to have the patience and, you know, even though I've been in entertainment now probably for 18 years, there was a 12 or 13 years prior to that where I was in a completely different industry. Mm. I probably would have been better served, although logistically it would have been a difficult thing to do, to be in the entertainment industry from the beginning of my career. Yeah. Because I think the you know, the people that I come across that are CFOs of other entertainment companies are quite often people that cut their teeth, you know, in their mm. profession in the entertainment industry. And so they have that much more experience. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm making up for lost time by trying to <laughs> gather as much experience as possible <laughs> to feel like I've uh, seen everything, but it's still, it's, it's, I still feel like, um, you know, I can't walk in the room and say I've got the 30 or 35 years that say the president at Blumhouse has yeah. because he started off, you know, basically from college onward yeah. uh, doing that sort of thing. But I mean. But there must be, I mean, there must be an advantage more often than it is a disadvantage just to have the kind of, well, first of all, for the team or the organization to have the plurality of views or opinions or, you know, uh, ways of looking at it. Um but then also for you that you see things slightly differently perhaps than someone who's um, you know in the industry for such a long time and just sees yeah. it the way they do. Because um, obviously there's things that you look at maybe differently than, mm -hmm. than someone that has been in the entertainment industry their entire life. No, um, I, and I totally agree yeah. with you. And uh, I would I, always say that's an asset. That's, that's something that is super helpful. Right. I, I, and I, I totally agree with you on that. And I, and I think that I've been able to draw on that experience that the non-entertainment experience, but I think in, within the industry itself, because, you know, again, going back to the fact that it's a very risky business, mm. they need to go with what's safe at yep. certain levels. And I think that, you know, if you, if you can say, you know, you understand the industry. I've been in it for 20 years, whatever. Yeah. And it's like, okay, great. I don't have to yeah. worry about this person, you know, making some stupid mistake because yeah. they didn't okay. understand yeah. something. Um, and so it's, it's, there are very few, I've come across some people that mm. s agree with that point of view and say, you know, it's great to be able to draw on that sometimes because it's a, 
a bit of a breath of fresh air, but I think most just go, no, 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 no. Just I, all I, all I want is somebody who, who understands the business and I, you know, and I don't need to worry that you're still learning or don't yeah. know or yeah. whatever it is. Yeah. And you also have connections within the industry. Yeah. Cause like I said, it's small and it's a small community. That's true. So the interconnectivity yeah. of everything is really important. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah. that's why it is what it is, I guess. We talked a lot about the past. I'm very curious to hear what you think of the future of the industry, mm -hmm. um, something you're watching right now, trends, um, something that you'll think is going to be of growing relevance mm -hmm. that others should also pay attention to. Yeah, I mean, that's a lot. That's like a, <laughs> like a crystal your, ball. The crystal ball. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Just unpack that. that. <laughs> I mean, I, it, it, you know, like I said earlier, I, it's, it's definitely a land rush right now. Mm -hmm. and, and all the money that's in the space is going to, give a lot of companies the opportunity to make it in the, in the business. Um, but unfortunately that money will dry up at some point in time because, you know, the, the tech companies are spending a lot of money in this space mm -hmm. are no different than the Ron Burkles and, mm. and others, individuals mm. that have yeah. just spent their own money because they have lots of it to be in the sexy industry that is Hollywood. Yeah. You know, that all sounds great up to a point. And then even they have a breaking point where they will stop losing money and, and say, okay, I'm done. I'm yeah. leaving now. Yeah. Um, so that will happen uh, necessarily. And then the best will survive and, and the worst, which will be the majority, will die. Yeah. Um, but I think at a, at a so, that, so that's sort of like the cyclical nature of the industry. Mm -hmm. So that, that's, that's one thing. And then, um, you know, I, I, I see... The, what we call television is not really television mm. anymore. You know, film is film, but it's only, the only difference between film and television in the in the traditional sense today I see is just the running time. Yeah. It being different between the two and whether something is multiple episodes or whether it's just a one-off, two-hour plus or minus yeah. uh, storytelling. Um, and so I, I just see those merging into one. Yeah. Um, so the companies that are doing both are really just going to be doing one and calling it something. Mm film, TV, whatever, you know? Um, so I, I think it, once again, it, the, the, the fundamentals of the business will not change. I don't think, mm. which is original content creation. Yeah. And so the people that can deliver the content that people want to watch the most, it won't matter how they want to view them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That will matter yeah. and it'll it always matter. Um, and it's just how people are consuming them that we're, we're obsessed with now. So, I, you know, I, I, I won't pretend to predict which, uh, <laughs> you know, which avenue will, will no. win over another one, no. but it'll just be multiples. No. And, you know, the dire predictions, even from 15 plus years ago of collapsing windows and <laughs> all that sort of stuff yeah. um, in the industry, I think will finally come to pass. And then business models will just have to adjust to that reality. Yeah. Um, not saying that the Netflix model or the, the Amazon model or whatever will necessarily win the day because I never underestimate the ingenuity of people to come up with new and different yep. exciting yep. ways to deal with stuff. But so that's, that's, I, that's kind of what I'm expecting, I guess, yep. is, is just how this stuff gets merged and, mm. uh, and the collapsing windows that you can really see, um, what you want, when you want, where you want, and yep. uh, it'll just be a matter of price. Perfect. We'll both uh, review this <laughs> in <laughs> yeah. some time. Uh, it's a perfect uh, note to end it on. Thank you so much, Roland, for your time and oh, thank you. your insights. Um, it's been a, a, an amazing journey and um, mm -hmm. looking forward to seeing what's next. Yeah, no, absolutely. I enjoyed it very much. Thank you. Thank you. This episode is part two of a special double episode with Roland Weishofer. If you haven't listened to part one of our Roland Weishofer special yet, be sure to tune in to catch the full story. In part one, Roland talks about getting started as a supervising accountant and learning the ropes in the construction, automotive and manufacturing industry before taking first steps in the entertainment industry with one of the hottest and most buzzed companies at the time. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. We'd love to hear from you now. Please let us know what you think of the show and this episode. Leave us a comment, send us a message or tweet. And we're looking forward to welcoming you on our next episode. By the way, you can follow Media CFO on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And if you haven't already, please subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcasts and rate and review this podcast. Again, thank you for listening and bye-bye.
The Media CFO Podcast is hosted by Tobias Sieger. Our executive producer is Bridget Scar. Digital editing by Christina Vogt and Antanasios Karakantas. Design by Daniel Cottis. Many thanks to Anouk van Gemen and Frederick Jäger for their creative review. The notes for the show can be found on www.themediacfo.com. Copyright 2019, Polybri Studios. Thank you.